Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Bosco, and I'm here with uh, my colleagues, uh, all of us who have a hand in the uh, documentary Flannery. Um, and um, we're this is our fourth of, uh, of a series of four conversations about Flannery O'Connor. Um, we're hoping that you've all seen the movie and that you uh, have a desire to chat with us a little bit. We're just gonna have a conversation about Flannery O'Connor and the craft of her art, the craft of writing, the craft of composing, the craft of filming a life of Flannery. Um, I wanna introduce everybody, but remember there's gonna be a chat space for everyone to join us. So please feel free uh, to be give a respectful chat uh, question uh, to our group. <laughs> And uh, we'll be monitoring those, so hopefully halfway in, we'll be able to get to some of your questions. So I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce our, our panelists today, uh, our, and, and, um, and then we'll go into a first question and we'll let uh, uh, things go from there. So again, we have, we're really delighted to have Alice McDermott with us. Uh, we're so glad that she could sit with us. We, we caught her in Chicago while she was giving a talk actually at another university uh, and she sat with us and gave really just a, a one hour beautiful um, uh, uh, interview. Alice is a celebrated and award winning uh, novelist and professor of the humanities, well, emerita now, I just found out, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, she's won the US National Book Award for uh, her 1998 novel, Charming Billy. She's been a finalist and shortlisted for many literary awards throughout the years. Um, I've been reading. I've been reading uh, Alice's work since Charming Billy. I've taught a few of her works in classes. Um, her publishers are the same uh, that uh, company that published Flannery O'Connor, uh, of course, Strauss and Jerusalem. There's a nice connection there. Uh, her most recent novel, The Ninth Hour, came out in 2017, uh, and I think reveals how deeply her literary and religious imagination are really engaged in her craft of writing. So thank you, Alice, for being with us. We really appreciate it. We have Miriam Cutler, uh, who is our Los Angeles-based <laughs> film composer. Uh, she's also an award-winning uh, composer and scorer for film. Um, her recent scores include RBG, uh, Dark Money, Love, Gilda, Dilemma of Desire, and of course, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, we met in well, while she was doing a special um, term at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, we were just so excited to have her and her expertise. She's a member of the documentary branch of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And you, you co-founded the Alliance for Women Film Composers uh, as a way to provide visibility and advocacy for women uh, composers. So mm -hmm. we're so excited uh, that you're with us too uh, out in LA. We have with Elizabeth sitting there, Ted Hardin. Uh, he is our cinematographer and what I call the consultant on just about everything we had to do on our film. <laughs> Always gave great advice. Uh, we often took that advice. Uh, he teaches at Columbia College uh, and has worked with Elizabeth Kaufman on many, many documentary films uh, with their film company, Long Distance Media. And um, it's just been a, a, a great ride to have uh, uh, Ted, in our, Ted in, in our world of flattery. And then, of course, we have Elizabeth Kaufman, uh, my co-producer, co-director, who uh, in many ways is responsible for the, this final product, the film that we have. Uh, and so we're just really grateful to have everyone with us today uh, for a conversation about class. So I said I'd start off with this one question, uh, just so we kind of hear what people think. Um, what is the one, uh, perhaps, um, uh, novel or, or, or story uh, that you think most, that Flannery kind of wrote, that you think just most exhibits or illustrates her craft or just the, the, the genius of her craft as an artist. And um, anybody want to go first on this one, you know? Um, I'll, 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 I'll tackle that. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thanks everybody for this fabulous film. Um, it, it's really very difficult to say, um, that there's there's any one piece of writing that Flannery did that that displays her craft because it all does. Um, she she was such a careful writer, and such a careful craftsperson. Um, but watching the film, um, I was brought back to a story of hers that I hadn't read in years, and it's that wonderful shot in the film um, of the train station um, when Flannery is coming back from New York and sick and, um, and uh, her cousin mentions how her uncle, when he picked her up, 
said she looked like she was 100 years old. And immediately I flash back to The Enduring Chill, which I think I probably hadn't read in a decade, but that's the opening scene <laughs> um, of The Enduring Chill. And I think that's, that's a story that you can look at very autobiographical. And I think the film sort of um, opened my eyes to that. Uh, although the main character is is male, but he's a male writer um, coming, a southerner coming back from New York, feeling terrible, very sick. Um, and, and you look at a, a story like The Enduring Chill and you see um, just how well uh, Flannery knew how to build a story. Um, you have that opening just like the shot in the film of the train station. Um, you have which she does quite often in her stories, the sun. Yeah. Uh, there's sunlight or moonlight at the beginning of so many of her stories, sort of placing her characters on this spinning globe. Um, and even in the very first paragraph, an indication of transcendence. Um, when Asbury is, is returning and he sees his mother and he's glad his mother sees how sick he is, um, but he also looks out on the town at the town, and there's just a moment because of the sun that it may be transformed. It isn't. His mother's face comes back to him, but that's so Flannery, and everything is set up yeah. in that in that opening paragraph. Just beautiful craftsmanship. Nothing, um, nothing unnecessary, but everything is there, um, and. She does that in everything, but it's it was lovely to revisit, thanks to the film, to revisit this story um, and, and see how carefully. And I just love the fact that I saw the, the shot in the film and thought, oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I read that story. <laughs> yeah. It's That's wonderful. Great. Thanks, great. Thanks, Alice. Mary, what do you think? Well, so I'm a music person, um, not a big reader of literature anymore since college. Um, and I get most of my information from films I work on, documentaries, you know, and so thankfully, having been invited to work on this film, I did a little background research and realized, I, while I've never read her work, most of my literary friends have, I have a lot of writer friends and stuff, and they were really thrilled about it. And I also had a vague memories of early television stuff I'd seen. You know, because I grew up in the, I mean, I was born in the 50s and I grew up, you know, during the time when they did live stuff on television, you know, Westinghouse Play, West, yeah, something like that, Westinghouse Playhouse and stuff. And so I knew that I had, I was familiar, I remembered some stuff. But uh, when I first started, you know, thinking about when Elizabeth and I were st first starting to work together, I asked her to send me Wise Blood. Mm. And, you know, I couldn't even believe that a film like that got made at that time. I mean, it was so mind blowing. It was almost like something you'd see in the seventies, you know, like when people were pushing the envelope on storytelling and craziness. So I was really amazed. And, and the whole idea that John Huston, this major director had done it and felt bamboozled at the end of it, you know? So um, that gave me sort of a, a feeling for the material, you know, like, okay, we're not dealing with an average storytelling person, you know? Um, so she was quite unique, had a very person, had her own point of view, which was kind of remarkable that it was so popular at a time when people seemed so closed, you know, yeah. that it made it to television and stuff, you know, to a wider audience. Um, shows you how far television has fallen, <laughs> you know, but, but um, so for me, it was uh, an opportunity to become familiar with her work through the film and just getting this wide range of the quirkiness, the irony, you know, her sense of irony, the way she really told things as they really are in a way that you couldn't uh, refuse taking in. <laughs> anyway, I found it, you know, so for me, I'm glad that I learned a lot about her and I understand how she fits into the development in American literature and how important she was as a voice and how many people are still like the effect she's had in film work, you know, in television, in just in writing. So, so many people that we all value as major artists are so invested in her work and so influenced by it, which is a great thing to know that someone as unique as her could have that much influence over the culture we have today. So it was, it's been fun. And I love the drawings and illustrations in the film. They helped me be able to sort of, I thought they really captured the essence of what was what the stories were about. So to put music to that was very fun. You know, it was really fun. I could get a little more quirky sometimes and that was really fun. Cool. Thanks.
Thanks. What about you, Ted? Is there a is there a story that you just like? Oh wow, this is you know, it just kind of showed uh, her 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 genius as a as a writer. Right. I I I, I would echo what Alice said, which is it's really hard to, to locate it to one story. Um, there there is a theme that I um, or maybe a, a kind of craftsmanship that I was looking uh, or admiring and and have thought. Um, deeply about and so much so that I, I think there's there's probably a course uh, proposal that I'll do in my <laughs> film department about Flannery O'Connor's economy of space in cinematic directing. Wow. Uh, and I say that with a caveat because I, I when I was reading one of her first stories, The Geranium, I was just amazed about I saw everything that she's describing but you know, one can look out the window, we're sitting in front of a window and there's a tornado going by, <laughs> sort of the vestiges of a tornado with lightning strikes. Anyway, sorry, we can't pivot the camera. Um, but she was really great at reporting th those de details. And so as a, a documentary um, cinematographer, I immediately latched onto that. There, it, it seemed like not a wasted shot. Uh, and there's a there's either a musicality in a in a, in a clair, clair, clarity sense of directing us to attend to exactly what we need to deepen our engagement in why we are looking. So you know we we're looking at the tornado and thankfully it's from a distance <laughs> <laughs> as one wants to be, right? However, stories sort of invite us in, and you know you want that that sort of dance of, of uh, a wider perspective and something closer and then ultimately something really interior. Um, but you know, the, the Geranian, she was practicing uh, at an interiority, which is the hardest thing for cinema to do, which is to transport us using our tools, uh, images and sounds to transport us to feel a line, care about something that we don't have access to. Um, in literature, you can, you can just go there with description, but Flannery actually would pivot with perspective and show yeah. what a character would actually see that we wouldn't have thought that we were going to make that jump. And so that, you know, several other of her short stories, uh, um, A Good Man is Hard to Find has this clarity, but so much more, right? So you can tell uh, there's so much more going on as she ups her game and craft. However, I, you know, my, my, one of my forays in life was uh, ger German uh, literature, especially romantic literature and, and turn of the century literature. And there was this one phrase which Flannery doesn't do very often, but late encounter with the enemy is so fascinating to me because it does what everything I just said about an old Civil War general being hauled up on stage oh. to attend, you know, a graduation ceremony of a family member. Um, but this <laughs> interplay of, we see all of that and it's weird and horrifying and just, it's ugh, it. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's riffing off of Gone with the Wind and her <laughs> way of kind of uh, working through that. But then we go to the interiority of a man, a character with deep in dementia who's time traveling in his mind and, and fumbling around and we, we, see the, we see it clearly. So yeah. that, that is amazing. So the term and from my previous life in German literature was this, it's a wonderful um, arabesque from, from sort of a clarity of naturalism to, to a, a, a kind of fanciful, ephemeral it's really hard to it's not an analytically concrete um to, to this other kind of perspective and that is a dream for cinema for for cinematography you know so the, we we generally only can achieve that kind of feeling in a close-up and generally it's a out of focus close-up <laughs> or or something uh, that's that's again playing with the tools and then of course sound and what a joy to work with uh, Miriam and you know, and you got it, it was it was quite rich experience uh, bringing all this together. So thanks, Ted. Elizabeth, any uh, any story? I mean, we've been we've been at this for a while, but uh... well, 
you know, when we're surrounded by the talented people who help <laughs> make the film what it is, you know, as I think Miriam and, and Ted uses and, and Alice even suggested this term musicality, the, the craftsmanship of the language choices. And because when we're adapting to film, we do have to make things material and we have to hear them and we have to see them. So we go to space, we go to flora and fauna to, you know, as I was just thinking today, I was thinking of a good man is hard to find. And in the film we have, I love the line um, about the moonlight in the trees and the meanest of them sparkled. <laughs> you know, just that phrase, the meanest of them sparkled, talking about the moonlight reflection in the trees. I mean, so our animator, Natalie Barahona had that, you know, she loved trying to visually riff on that line. And and Miriam, I don't know what you thought of that, that um, moment. If, I mean, it just is, it's, a, it's the end of a sequence. So it's a moment of transition. And um, that's a spe special kind of composition moment. Um, and that I love what Miriam does all the time in terms of <laughs> both referencing you know, we're moving in the film, we're moving through these historical eras too. And the ability, Miriam's choices of music and instrument, we can get to instrument here too, that helped us move through the 40s and the 50s into the 60s. Um, you know, that that sonic environment um, musically really where it carries us along. Along with, and Ted did sound design with roosters and peacocks and but, <laughs> That also helps. I like jamming with roosters and peacocks. <laughs> I would say, like, I, I would say for me, I guess, um, I think good country people because you know she writes this in four days and she's in the she's in mid career, and uh, she sends it to Caroline Gordon and says, "What are you thinking?" Caroline gives her some long, you know, um, suggestions about putting uh, Mrs. Hopewell in, in the beginning. But here's a story in which. You get um, you get color. You get um, you get um, you get a sense of pacing. You you think the story in the first six eight pages is going to be about Mrs. Hopewell, but it's actually going to be about Holga. And all of a sudden, you don't even know how you turn, but all of a sudden, you're with Holga. You know, at the very end. And then coming out of it again, talk about a telescopic lens, Ted. After she's left in the barn, we go back to them farming. You know, seeing him walking off, not. Not with Kolga, but really with Mrs. Hopewell, you know, and Mrs. Freeman. And I did I, I feel like of any story, I feel like I'm being brought in, boom, and I'm being brought back out. Almost kind of like a they're all kind of like 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 Greek tragedies in some ways. They have that kind of pop. <laughs> but um, but there was something about that. And I thought to myself, she did that in four days. You know, and the only thing that Sir Caroline Gordon really said was, you know, let's 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 make this the beginning and this the end and move those around, she did it, uh, edited it, and then it was just a great, fantastic story. So, um, that, so that was my, I mean, again, like you all say, she's, she's, uh, she's sui generis in terms of craft, she's just so good at it. Um, I wanna, so let's kind of maybe kind of rotate through a kind of the thing we've kind of touched upon so much uh, stuff already. But I do wanna ask Alice, maybe if you'd start us off, um, what do you think resonates with you most um, uh, you know, some say she's a descendant of Hawthorne, for instance. So she says that herself um, in the introduction to Marianne, or, or she's compared to Gogol and Dostoevsky and Kafka, all those, you know, Eastern European existential kinds of uh, <laughs> writers and stuff. Um, and yet, she writes these little like, parables. So I don't know. Anything you want to just talk about? You're 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 a writer. Uh, you have that in common with Flannery O'Connor's uh, uh, for sure. Anything could you just say about the craft that way? where she comes from. Well, I was just, as Ted was speaking, I mean, it just uh, immediately popped into my mind um, the influence of Conrad, which again, um, Flannery acknowledged, but, you know, Conrad saying the only obligation of the writer is to make you see. Mm -hmm. That's it. And it's above everything else. If that's all you have to do, but it's everything. Um, and I think for a cinematographer, that might be like right on. <laughs> uh, um, but that's that's what she does. I mean, th there is that um, th there's never a moment when when you're not um, fully aware 
of the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Flannery talks about that in her letters, that um, to do justice to the naming the things of the world, um, the accurate naming of the things of the world um, as a goal for, for creating these stories. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, the, the, the weirdness of Dostoevsky and, and Kafka, of course, um, will come to mind when, when you're reading Flannery. Um, uh, but I mean, the enduring chill, um, Flaubert is evoked at the end. It, it, the, the, the ending of the enduring chill is the ending of a simple heart, um, the descending of the Holy Spirit. Um, in, in the enduring, in the enduring chill, it's it's a, a water stain on the ceiling. Um, in Flaubert, it's a stuffed parrot, but it's she. You know, she's. It's a tip of the hat. There, there's yeah. no question that it's a tip of the hat to Flaubert. Again, a writer who was all about the right word to make you see the the stuff of the world. If you haven't got that, you haven't got anything. Yeah. Um, and and I can imagine. Um, the temptation, and I think this is maybe why, um, as weird as her work was to the contemporary audience, she ended up in television. Um, <laughs> she ended up having some of these stories, um, as she, as she talks about in uh, quoted in the film. You know, with with this tap dancer guy. You know? <laughs> I mean, who would put Gene Kelly and Flannery <laughs> O'Connor together? You know? But I think it is. I think it's the vividness of the world, and it's the thing that 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 I think Mark, what you're that pulls us in, even against our better judgment. Um, I remember the the first time I read A Good Man Is Hard to Find. I resisted. Um, I I resisted, and I remember saying to a professor, "I am not taking this story to any desert island. Um, <laughs> not something I want to hold on to." But, but you're there. Um, she pulls you in against your will because of the vividness um, of her scenes, and that's that's that again. She's good. that's that's Conrad. Um, that that's what he taught her. Wow. And, I, and I think equally with the with the vision is is the sound, right? Is I mean part of why, as filmmakers, we loved adapting O'Connor is because being cinematic is image and sound, and and the experiential nature of coming into the story. And as we reference both with sound design and with music. And we, you know, I spent a lot of time looking for the song she actually, O'Connor actually references in her short story. So in Temple, she re references, you go to your church and I'll go to mine. And we searched and searched and that you know, Miriam's laughing because we found this kind of awful recording of it, but it was so hard, <laughs> so hard to find. And and how I mean, Miriam, with the with the the musicality of of the sentiment of the emotion of the story, you know how, you know maybe you can go into instrument choice or you know that incredible. It's I know it's a little mysterious, but what you're so good at of <laughs> at grasping. Um, you know, that sentiment from playfulness to dark, you know, shifting from playfulness into a really dark sensibility pretty quickly. How, how does your choice of instrument help make that happen? Well, you know, <clears throat> what, was, what was really enjoyable for me as a composer working with someone like Flannery O'Connor is that she had this unique voice, very unique voice. And what she did was she presented stuff to us in a very folksy manner. So you're sort of innocently wandering into the story. And before you know it, you're caught up in this complex web of conflicts and values and weirdness and irony, you know? And I think that's how she draws the sophisticated reader in. Like you think you're gonna hear this. So with the music, you know, there were really strong elements to me that could make it help bring it to life, which is that we all think of the South, the lazy music, the banjo, the blues you know and stuff like that and then you have her really religious side which goes into this highly spiritual complex how do you how do you reconcile you know your faith with what you're seeing in front of your eyes of humanity you know and so she was so complex but she presented in a folksy manner so to me I wanted to capture some of that folksy feeling of the south that we all identify with the south and she seemed to really love that part of the South, the, the cadence of the language, you know, the way people spoke, the way they phrased, 
the these spoke sayings, you know, and and the weird logic that they would have about how you could be a real good church person, but you could kill somebody, but you better not not go to church, you know. Yeah, right. So I mean, for me, that was really, you know, so I wanted to have some kind of folksy element, but I didn't want to be right totally like to me a banjo would be too far. That's just too far. That's just too right on the nose. So for that kind of sound, I kind of used a ukulele, which had this innocent high thing that worked really well for her childhood. And I could sort of have it playing what a banjo might play when we're in the South, but it doesn't sound so totally right on. Very but the slide guitar, you gotta have the slide guitar, come on, you know. And, and the kind of the rhythm of the train, which a lot of that the blues from the South is with the rhythm of the train, you know, ta-da, 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 the shuffle. So, you know, that was really fun. I happen to love the blues and I'm very, I've been playing it and listening to it all my life. So for me, that was super fun, but also capturing her sophistication, you know? So I tried to actually sometimes have them cohabit, you know, these simple folksy sounds, but then we're complicating it with maybe some kind of a, over another layer of a sophisticated composition, you know, that would go deeper into the soul or the intellect or something like, you know, so that it would sort of, you know, that's what I was trying to do, even with the stories, like give it some drama, you know, accompany it with drama, but also reach for some of the various elements that were in the story from the folksiness to the cruelty or the irony or the meanness, you know, the, and the, and the was, violence. Was there one, you know? was one aspect that was the most difficult to kind of, that you really had to work the hardest uh, engage with a certain part of a story going into the storyline or is it going into her biography was there anything that was like hmm, how am I going to do this I mean did you have that did you have any roadblocks because all artists have roadblocks right right Alice <laughs> hey, our job is to overcome those yeah, that's exactly. what gets you usually the roadblocks are what lead to the best the best sure. uh, development you know the right. best stuff if it's not hard then you're repeating yourself yeah yeah so um you want okay. me to share? We have a, a link to some of your music, Miriam. Oh, sure. Here, let me let me see if this works. Let's see. Uh -uh. <laughs> there yeah i think it's a problem with streaming okay yeah <laughs> Probably would sound better with a link with a just showing on your laptop we'll, we'll put that link on to the facebook page though uh yeah uh, headline so uh, we'll ask jessica yes. to do that it'd be I'll good that yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah sorry about that everybody i keep on talking about the fact that you know it's like uh you go on a journey with o'connor um you know alice mentioned that uh ed mentions that cinemat cinematically miriam you were talking about that musically um and I was just wondering, I'm always reminded of a, of a comment that Tobias Wolf once said to me, another artist who's in the uh, writer who's in the show and our documentary. He says, teaching an MFA course, he always says, I always tell students, you, you have to grapple with Flannery O'Connor. You have to go through to the other side of Flannery. Yeah. You can't be Flannery O'Connor. You can't, but you've got to go because she's going to teach you so much. But you have to go to the other side. So I just was wondering, I mean, musically, getting to the other side, cinema, cinematically getting to the other side. Um, as, a, as a writer getting the other side. Is there something about, you know, uh, that you learned from O'Connor as a musician, as a cinematographer, as a writer? What was the thing, I mean, Alice, what did you, what did you take from when you said, oh, Flannery has this to teach all writers, it's just right there. Or what musically, the musicality, the sound, she just has this, you know, what, did, what would that be for you guys? Um, I, I think for me, uh, and, and thinking about what Toby said, um, you know, there, there is that that um, that grappling with the subject, which with the violence, which with the um, 
the sort of unvarnished truth of her characters. Um, you know, there's a lot of fury mm. in in her stories, in her characters. There, there's a lot of anger, and and yet she resists every time, saying to the reader directly, "But aren't we all?" And yet, <laughs> That's what you come away with, right. you know, that's, um, I mean, I've, I've been amused, you know, with um, some recent objections to, to Flannery's work and in cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I hear somebody complaining, I think, oh my God, you're Mrs. Turpin. <laughs> you know, you're the person because you think if you had been born in Georgia in 1926, you never would have used that N word. You would have been a fun. Exactly what Mrs. Turpin thinks. If I had been born a Negro, I would have been a nice Negro. I would have been a. And, and it's this amazing that you, you, you want to take people by the throat and say, you're the very person who needs to read Flannery O'Connor because she does. She's not going to lecture you. She's not going to do a. Uh, uh, to kill a mockingbird and make you feel good because you identify with the liberal lawyer. No, she's going to take you down to the depths, <laughs> you know, and she's not going to show you the way out. Um, but you're going to walk away from that story with that, with with something changed, um, both in what happens in the story and in what I, I've I've never looked at the world. I think what Ted was saying about that point of view change. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm resist. I don't want to look at the world through these eyes. And yet she brings you to it. And once you've done that, um, once, once, once you've looked out and you've, and you've had that interior life, um, the geranium is a great example of that. And then judgment day, the reworking of that same story. Um, once you've looked out, um, you can't go back. Uh, and, and there's no moral. There's no place, she, she says that she's not a subtle writer. I think in one of her letters, she says, you, you can't write for the, don't write for the subtle reader. Um, but, but I think that, that her subtlety is, is, um, is there. And, and sometimes it's, um, it's not appreciated because of the violence and because of the grotesque that she plays with. But I think there's tremendous subtlety in the emotional impact of her stories. And I, I would add to that, the subtlety comes also in close up, even though she doesn't use that. Ed, can you, I can't hear you. Could you just be a little closer? She, she uses that, the, the idea of a close up, but she uh -huh. doesn't use that term. She used more closely observed, almost miniature sometimes, these miniature mm. uh, facial expressions to objects, to um, observations around a corner that then she brings us into. Uh, so, you know, to, to go on with what you're saying, Alice, I, what I was looking for uh, while we moved around Milledgeville, Savannah, Iowa, you know, I was looking for what triggers, what were her triggers of inspirations, you know, um, sitting in a chair, looking out a farm window, you know, I, I exhausted, I, I shot every aspect of that. <laughs> I even went down the the trajectory of what a lens would see. And we had a drone come by. <laughs> and did that as well, you know. So I was really trying to figure out some of these things. Um, and also, we're we're also in modern in, in this contemporary moment. We're trying to capture something that may have literally disappeared architecturally, geographically, uh, and so on in terms of. Um, city design, road design, and so on. But we, you know, we kept looking. And so in other words, what I, what I really grappled with was her sense of mystery writing towards not fully understanding what she, what was the end of that kind of writerly exploratory process. And I, I keep uh, flashing on Kierkegaard from the little I know of his, his work in terms of this rhetorical writing, but really in a fictional context, because she was, as we know, a, a famous rewriter. Um, however, her first impulses were astonishing. They were so rewarding. Um, and, and also in working, and I, I have a bit more of a sort of a artist uh, training in a second life, a separate from the uh, German literature, I went on to an art department. And so 
Um, I actually do a lot of shooting and, and whatever, uh, imaging and, and realization. I, I use a lot of other senses too, like texture and smell. And in particular, you know, like um, any, in a house that's been lived in for many, many years, you can kind of get a sense of the, the human presence um, in that sense. But the texture is what is often overlooked. And textures, as Miriam knows, texture is so useful as a term, uh, certainly with writing as well. But uh, it's really, it mobilizes uh, different kinds of choices. Uh, and and uh, you can get at kind of things that are comfortable, that range, that spectrum of comfort to discomfort, so that you, you bake in a natural sense of contrast uh, and, and sort of like division between um, sort of things that are, that are yeah. either obvious or not obvious. Ted, I was watching the film with a, few, with a bunch of Jesuits. Uh, obviously, I'm a Jesuit. So we were all watching it on a big screen. But they, one of them said they loved how the film went to doors and windows and, and, and spent a little time almost they said those were contemplative moments of the pacing of for them of the life of Flannery. Um, and I just thought there was I just thought you should know that, that I mean we, we had a conversation about that. I, and it was really a moment there was almost like moments of transcendence uh, in, in, in our in our film, I think. So uh, well done. Yeah, and it was interesting. Uh, that, that, that was a question you sent a little yeah, early. Yeah, I was exactly. about that because uh, a lot of times when you shoot a door, it's often depicted exactly like this in a flat two dimensional sense. Um, and we have some of those shots as well. But we're, we're, we're trying, I was trying to work with the focus poles too, so that you, you saw all these different planes of focus. And that feels more aligned with how Flannery looked at the world, where she she saw the totality of it, but she knows the limitation of being human, right, right. the capacity of we can only attend to maybe one 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 or two planes at a time of focus. It's really hard for us to kind of take in the the whole holistic kind of uh, picture, let alone the impact of all yeah. of these things. Um, but but we know for the, the, all the, the eventual reading and uh, the, the final impact of, of a piece is, uh, is a, generally a variation on this insight into the, the grand you know, project. Um, and it, she's just brilliant in, in getting us to kind of- uh, I like how it kind of gave us the sense of threshold mystery. There's an inside and an outside, whether she's you know, from the inside looking out to a church or looking out to the, to the Andalusia. There was a sense of the, that those two worlds that she had to live in, that very private, I'm on Milledgeville, and then the, and that imaginative world where she just creates these amazing stories that are so concrete and particular in the world. So yeah, it's really cool. Miriam, I think you wanted to say something. I didn't mean to. Oh yeah, oh, that's okay. I was just thinking about how she's basically, show, she's presenting these very folksy characters that we think are someone else. But the truth is she's showing us ourselves and we're watching it because there's a, they're not us. We don't think they're us, but all these qualities that they have, all the meanness, the pettiness, you know, the ignorance, the racism, whatever it is, we're seeing it as someone else, even though it's us. And so that's her little way of going gridgy, you know, like she's saying, I fooled you, you know, you think this is about some folksy little village person, but it's really you, honey, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of ironic. And I think that's part of what uh, the more sophisticated reader will probably take, and that's where the music also can sort of either support that, you know, like this is actually quite personal and to be taken seriously, even though it's some character that we associate with farming in a little tiny southern farm, you know, yeah. uh, sp spouting a lot of crazy stuff, you know. Yeah. So I, I thought, you know, that's what's so amazing is, to me, it's the quality of this folksiness and this complete sophistication and really complex thinking and presentation that probably is why so many other artists are so invested in her work, you know, because they they see themselves in it. We see us all, you know, and so anyway, and then the other thing I was going to say is that part of the folksiness is the vernacular of the dialogue, which she, which you go into in the film. We talk about how important it was to her to stay in, in, immersed in that vernacular. And that vernacular, you know, suggests certain kinds of music too. Right, right. You know, so so there you have more of that folksy, bluesy kind of music, but then hopefully infused with this other sophisticated subtext. 
coming in music that can suggest something more is going on than what meets the eye, you know. Yeah. There's, there's some jazz in there too. I there's think. some and, jazz. And, and some cello. I mean, that, that, oh yeah. when you got into the cello, you're in a deep moment. And I mean, really the music just kind of allowed us to kind of go from the comedy uh, and the fun of her stories to these moments of, you know, um, in her own life even, you know, these moments of death. I mean, well, it's like there's a tragedy and there's this whole spiritual world that she really inhabits. And and I think sometimes what could happen in the film was they're all woven together in certain points, you know, so that we understand where her work comes from. It's so deeply, it's so deep and it's got so much faith and, relig you know, religious philosophy and stuff like that infused into it. So it makes the folksy stuff way more layered, you know, and, and interesting. Well, and that uh, Marion, that's what some of our uh, commenters have mentioned on Facebook. Laura Soria, uh, a couple of people said they love the music, even if it was sounding <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they love the music. Laura Soria said there's a sense of comedy in the music. And, and so that folksiness that you're talking about, uh, people could really pick up on that. Um, Laura also mentioned, she's like, did I spot peeling paint in her bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> And, you're done and, it's, it's, next year. Yeah. Well, and we and you went back after the painting was done. You decided to keep the old, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, because exactly. if you go to Andalusia today, it's been all rehab rehabbed and painted to the what colors they thought. And they did a really great job, just an unbelievable yeah. job. They moved the kitchen back to where it was. Uh, things were located, um, but it's, it was it was shocking to go in there when it was still kind of peeling and still had that kind of <laughs> almost antebellum old nostalgia for a, for a kind of, a, but it actually works, right? It kind of fits Flannery O'Connor's, you know, uh, like she wouldn't see any of that because she'd be writing or she'd be reading Thomas Aquinas or she'd be answering a letter, you know? Um, and then at the same time, yeah, so I, I so you, did, you decided to, to use, we decided, I guess I should say Elizabeth decided <laughs> to use the- uh, We the should old both, but I, 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 I <laughs> championing the peeling paint because to your point you know like she would rather write than have some crazy handyman painting up you know <laughs> you know and, and all of us know in the pandemic it's like we sure we've gotten to a few more house projects but we know <laughs> we never finish that list <laughs> we never, we never end the list you know? and i i think flannery had a lot of things that she was working on so uh, yeah that's great Here's another comment from uh, Leah Kral said that the recently published letters of Flannery O'Connor and Caroline Gordon have a lot of insight on O'Connor's writing craft and how that relationship. Yeah, Christine Flanagan did a great job of putting that together. Um, she's been, uh, she's just been really a wonderful scholar. She's in Philadelphia, I think actually. Um, and, um, and it really does give us Caroline Gordon insight. So we get a little bit of Flannery, um, Flannery talking about in Caroline, Caroline, Caroline Gordon in the habit of being, but it's nice to see back to back the, the letters, you know, and Caroline's uh, real um, work at helping uh, her hone her craft. I mean, you know, I think of Caroline Gordon as the, the modernist craft maker, right? You know, and, and she wants her to be this, she wants her to be this kind of formalist. And she is, she's got a, there's a formalism to it in many ways structuring your stories. So it's a really great read if you're interested in Flannery O'Connor's craft uh, to see how Caroline helped. She didn't always take Caroline's advice, um, but, she, <laughs> but she always valued the fact that she she had to listen and she had to make pick and choose from that. So great, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting to think about. I mean, Mark, this is your first film, but you see how collaborative <laughs> filmmaking it is and how, you know, how, let's say with writers, you how an editor can really help you and, and how an editor works with you and how you listen to what they say, how you ignore what they're going to say and how, but how, how many of us as artists in achieving our vision um, really are working with other artists and other editors to bounce ideas off of. I mean, we, we, we live so much in that singular author, you know, it's the one person gets the credit, but, you know, clearly with a project like Flannery, we've got all these great artists coming together. But I, I'm wondering how I think, Alice and Miriam, how you all think about working with editors or how you how you bounce your ideas. Do you have close readers or listeners? I mean, Miriam, you've got 
Carl. <laughs> I've got Carl. Um, you know, I do my collaborating with the film team. You know, some sometimes the editors are really good with music and a director may not have as e much ease in the dialogue because the editors are more hands-on while they're putting in temporary music to sort of help with the flow of the film. Um, but every single film I do is different and, and the kind of collaboration, film composers have to be very flexible. We have to find whatever our best means of communicating with our team are and just work those. You know, I've had filmmakers who are totally unable to articulate anything about music. So I've had to develop ways to help ease that because I really believe if you're making a film, you're gonna know when music is working and when it's not working. But you may not understand that you can actually take information from hearing it and give me feedback so that you can tell me where it's not working. You know, I think you can, that's a point of departure. They often enter the relationship, you know, going, I don't know, the first thing they say, I don't know anything about music. Well, you actually do. You're gonna know if it's working in your film. So for what you're trying to do. Now you may get confused because there's, there's so many nuances and like within happy, there's endless amounts of degrees of happy. So half my job is calibrating, you know, like I do this um, when I'm teaching, I do this presentation where I take a very benign piece of film. It's, it's like some Malaysia or something, some village, a guy is fixing a roof and they're talking in another language. We don't know what they're saying. I can put music on that makes him a villain. I can make you afraid of him. I can make it like there's just been this horrible hurricane and now people are trying to rebuild. I can make him a comedy figure. I can create suspense. I can slow time down, speed it up. And that's the language of music in the context of film and storytelling. So once a filmmaker absorbs that, I think it's much easier to direct your composer and it becomes much more fun because it is, it's got to be collaborative. I have got to be telling the same story that you're telling. And you can see how, how nuanced it can get where I can take the audience and confuse them about what's being said. You know, and there's a whole film worth of music that can be misleading or it can be a too editorial. Or, or too obtrusive, you know? So those are the kinds of things we create the parameters and first we create, you know, what is the function of the music in this film? And then we talk about what is the sonic landscape? You know, we create, you know, you don't wanna confuse things by having tons of different instruments and always sounding different, you know, unless that's the goal. But if you're telling, if you wanna be a thread that pulls the narrative along in a cohesive way, you create things that, that uh, organize and make it, you know, and help in the organization of the story in the filmmaking so that once we're on the same page, then it's really exciting. You know, it's very hard work to find that language. It's, it takes a while sometimes at the beginning, but once you get in on the same page, it's, it's glorious really, you know, things come together in a way you go, you know, I can solve Like if there's an editing issue or a sound problem, music can help with that. You know, I can also, you know, I always tell the filmmakers, it's like punctuation. You know, you think of music as punctuation. Are you underlining something, putting yeah. an exclamation point, creating a pause with a comma, uh, putting quotes around it so to suggest another meaning? Am I reinforcing something that's already there or adding a layer that doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. You know, so those are, if you think of it that way, I don't think it's as confusing for a filmmaker because that's part of storytelling, you know, so. You've written a great article about how to help document <laughs> Directors yes. work with composers. It's my life's work. It's my <laughs> life's work. I believe so strongly in documentary filmmakers and their talent, their spunk, you know, their gorilla, their ability to just go in and be incredibly courageous and sacrifice to tell a story. So I believe they can do, they can direct a, direct a composer. I don't think it's that hard. Think of us as an editor. You know, how do you talk to your editor? How did you get your editor to understand your vision of the film? It's really the same. Mm -hmm. And Miriam, the, you and I never talked about this particular moment, but it, it's just, it, when I was doing the sound design, it was fun to sort of embrace what you were getting at, which what you spoke about quite nicely before about the something from the South and it's folksy, it's relatable, but it has the driving quality of the train. But, but with that train sound with the driving and, and travel was also slightly upbeat, but it can be it, it can have solitude or you know loneliness it can have this mixture and so i was looking and looking because i know we shot a couple scenes from inside the house in millage of millage and andalusia when it was raining outside and i was looking to add 
a thunderstorm. <laughs> I had, we had the images. I know I shot the images that could work. And, and so, and what we haven't talked about yet is mood, but there was a couple uh, shots panning across the parlor, out the windows, and we were able to kind of craft, you know, close-ups of the windows, long shots, and then end with this pan and, and to layer in the sound of thunder, rain, and some other things. And our, our mixer, Mark Bandy, did a great job. Um, but, but it was interesting, I was talking to you your music because there, ah. was, there was a moment where uh, I, I don't think there's a, a musical element at that point but you yeah. set it up right right you that frequency shift yeah. and mood yeah. is the ultimate there's goal. a beat and then the thunder you right. hear the thunder and well, mood, mood it's uh, a handoff it's kind yeah. of a handoff yeah and we work together without even like knowing oh it. yeah i mean really so many like there's rhythm in the film. There's so much rhythm already in the film before you put music. There's the, the rhythm of the dialogue, the cadence and the stops and starts, and there's the edits. And then within every frame, there's movement. So what the music, like it totally suggests music. And also remember music can do more than one thing at a time. I can be scaring you and also making you feel angst. You know, I, I, can, I can be going fast but suggesting that you're stuck, you know? I mean, it's really fascinating when you think about it in those terms, because music is such a, it's such a visceral form of communication and, it's, and it gives information subconsciously to the listener. So we can work with the subconscious also and suggest, uh, suggest a common thread. So I use a certain theme here and then the filmmaker says, oh, I'm gonna put that there. So now you're connecting two ideas, which a viewer won't really understand that that's what's happening, but those are all the things we do to focus their attention, whether conscious or unconscious. Oh, that's familiar. I remember hearing that and I felt this way when I heard it. Now I'm feeling this way when I hear it. You know, All these kinds of subtle ways, it's like in writing, I'm sure too, where you add these layers and, and they're, they're, some of them are just tools that you know about in your toolbox that every writer knows about or every composer knows about or every filmmaker knows about, but they're so effective when they're used in a focused way, so. Alice, how would you, you know, what, what does an editor mean to you as a writer collaboratively? Oh, I didn't even answer that. <laughs> Alice, you heard very good. A collaboration is, um, is, is something I struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my world. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, the, one of the, 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 the really, um, personally wonderful parts of the film for me was listening to, to dear Bob Giroux mm -hmm. um, talk about uh, Flannery and, um, and, um, and seeing him again and hearing his wonderful voice. Um, I, I was reminded that he, is, he's, he was the kind of editor um, who told you everything would be all right. <laughs> no matter what he said to you, the, what you heard, the music of, of whatever he said to you was, you're a wonderful writer and everything's going to be all right. And, and hearing him within the context of the film and recalling my own uh, interactions with him, uh, I thought how valuable that voice must have been for Flannery. Um, as isolated as she was, as confined as she was, um, to have this gent, and he was a gentle gentleman, um, to have this gentle and reassuring voice, not so much the line by line editor that Catherine Carver were, that Carolyn Gordon was, um, but, but that sense of, um, you know what you're doing. Even if it's not there yet, you'll find it. You're a wonderful writer, <laughs> I'm here for you. Um, that's my favorite kind of editor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Elizabeth was for me when I was like, oh my God, this is not happening. Calm like, down, Mark. We're working on it. It's going to come. It's going to come. But yeah, you're right. No. Yeah, it is, isn't that, that, that footage from uh, Christopher O'Hare with Sally Fitzgerald and Bob Giroux? I mean, it's just it's so wonderful to see these people who have, who have passed, but yet are so important still to many generations of writers um, uh, and to fans. So, yeah. We have the one question here I, we, we want to get to before we go um, from Catherine Crutzer Laborde. Uh, she says, please talk about the decision to add the sound of walking with crutches. When I saw the film the first time, I was blown away by this. Wow. 
spent a lot of time on that one. Well, it has a funny story behind it as well. Um, I mean, we, first of all, we were chasing those very crutches to make that sound. Um, <laughs> however, remember this, yeah. It's really, it, it's, it's the, we did find, we found one example and it wasn't quite as convincing, but I found another kind of crutches um, that, that it has the, it's a mixture of like creaking and screws being loose and, and the pressure of the floor, usually a hardwood floor. And so we were chasing it and weirdly we were on our way to a preview screening in New Orleans with you, Mark. And, and um, I had actually hurt my knee again recently, you know, at that time. But so we were going, we turned in the rental car from whatever city we were flying from to fly to New Orleans. And I look over and by the trash can is a pair of crutches. <laughs> and so I thought, wow, this. Great, like, exactly. So we, we, and here's the tip for travelers. You can get through airports really fast if you have crutches because someone will give you a ride. <laughs> uh, you get to board the plane first and so I don't I don't know what the during the pandemic if any of that's useful but anyway we ended up in New Orleans the night before the screening we check into our place and lo and behold there's a hardwood floor beautiful echoey spot and it it was meant to be and so we recorded it cut it in that night and that's what you heard Mark uh, <laughs> with Sister Mary Perjan and other hey, folks that yeah. Well, I'm Prashant, sorry. And, um, and yeah, it's like, it's one of the moments, and Miriam knows this too, you know something is working when you make these choices and you do the craft and work, whatever, but then you, you watch it in context, you hear it in context, and it, I, I, I almost would tear up every time I heard it. <laughs> it's just, it transcends the craft, uh, and I say this humbly, I'm not saying it with confidence and it. it's like I feel something really is powerful so it's a great question uh, and I, I still feel the same way <laughs> <laughs> bringing all these things together you know um, uh, up the, the concrete particularities of, of the talent that all of you have uh, engaged with Barry O'Connor's particular concrete talents and her love of the concrete uh, and to, to build something that's really universal. I mean, um, you know, music is something universal. Uh, Alice, your stories are, are all, your novels are always about, not always, but this, you know, that Irish American experience, but it's a universal experience, right, of, 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 an, of, of America. Um, and Ted, you have shown us, and Elizabeth certainly, um, how just a documentary on one little part of Louisiana, uh, the bayous, can be a universal kind of film or even better, Venice, the, you know, the, the <laughs> death of Venice being the flooding of Venice. So I just, I think I find it interesting. You, I want to kind of end with that idea that with the collaboration, because it truly is, I mean, art is, it's not an isolated experience. It's always engaged with so many different facets of, of things. And it, it's the universal language, really, of our, our human adequacies and inadequacies. So um, a little bit of a homily there. Sorry, that's the joke. But uh, um, we just we just have a minute to go, and so uh, any any last comments by anybody um, before we before we end our conversation? Well, Elizabeth should speak just a little bit about the craft of editing, but I don't know if you can do it in a minute um, mm -hmm. because uh, she she we had a, quite a few folks who helped on editing. Yes, yes, it was a collaborative process. I was one of the lead editors along with Joe Winston, Melissa Stern, uh, had some great, great editors helping to craft that story. And I finally got, you know, I was so obsessed that I, I couldn't give <laughs> <it> up. <laughs> and then to try to bring the elements together, um, you know, just to make the magic work, right? It was a really masterful, Elizabeth. And I do, we, uh, you, the, what you have done uh, for Flannery, um, uh, putting that narrative really together. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a great film. I'm going to be using, I'm teaching a Flannery O'Connor seminar this uh, semester online, obviously at Georgetown. And um, uh, I can't wait to be part of, have that film be part of our conversation and stuff like that. Well, yeah. thank you guys so much for this uh, conversation. Um, it's just so great to see all of you. Uh, Los Angeles, um, well, Maryland, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, I'm so glad the tornado has passed in Chicago. Everyone seems to be okay. Uh, please come see our, go see our film. Uh, you know, 
You can do it easily in the, your house. Just click on the theater near you. Go to www.flammaryfilm.com. See where it's playing. Um, we'd love to hear, hear from you. We're going to try to put um, Miriam's piece of music into the Facebook link so we can hear it more clearly uh, <laughs> uh, when you get when you come on it again. Um, we really want to thank uh, everybody for for being part of uh, really being part of this film. Uh, you helped to make it what it is. So thanks so much. Thanks for a great film. It's a great experience. Loved it. All right. All right, guys. See you later. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>